Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 18. The title of our study is The One World Government. A few weeks ago, we looked at chapter 17 before Easter, and we took a look at the first Babylon, and we saw this one world religion, how the Antichrist used this one world religion to draw people unto himself, and um, that he then turned on people and said, now bow down and worship me. And so, um, as I was thinking about that, I thought, you know, not everyone would consider themselves religious. And I think that wouldn't include us. We're not really religious. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? Um, we know that we're born again. <laughs> we know that we connect with the Lord. But other people don't realize that. And so, I guess I would rephrase it. What about the non-faith-based people? There's a huge group today called the nuns. Uh, not the Catholic nuns, but they're none of faith. Um, they're atheists or agnostics, if you will. Uh, they don't want to associate with any kind of faith-based group. Well, how will the devil then use those people and draw them in to worship him? Because they're not interested in spiritual things. How will he convince them to bow before him and the Antichrist and worship him instead? As I was thinking about that, I found the answer here in chapter 18. Money and politics. If you go anywhere and have a conversation with someone and you throw out politics, you're going to get something going. If you talk about money, you're probably going to get a conversation going too. People love to talk about money. They love to talk about politics. Bring up religion? I don't know. Let's not bring Jesus into this, but they'll talk about those things. And so there's an ever-increasing interconnectedness today. Uh, the world is continuing to grow and expand, and global trade is on the rise. And, and with the Internet now and, and transactions happening all over in real time, we're seeing this uh, rise of technology and this rise of this interconnectedness between countries. Uh, where one country's economy begins to go down, it kind of affects all the other countries as well. And, and sadly, there are many who look to the stock market or they look to the government to um, find happiness or fulfillment. When my stock market is up and my account's going up, yes, things are awesome. God is blessing me. When it goes down, like, oh, Lord, come on, bring, the, bring it back up. I need, I need more money. I need more of this or that. Or, you know, when I get that big tax return, yes, thank you, Lord, the government, give me back my money versus, you know, hmm. Lord, it's all yours anyway. Help me just to be a good steward with it. And so we see that people look to those things to solve their problems and bless them with more money or provide them with a life of happiness. Um, and so here in chapter 18, we're going to see that those who put their trust in the economy or a world leader or even money are going to experience a great fall. And John calls this the fall of Babylon, which was great once, but in one day, it'll come to an end. And he'll describe this vision, this second Babylon that he has, right after the first vision of the first Babylon. So let's take a look at that together. We'll take a look at the first eight verses together. Then we'll look at verse 9 through 20 together. And then lastly, we'll look at verse 21 through 24 together. So let's take a look at these uh, first eight verses here in chapter 18. After these things, I saw... Another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she had rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. And the cup of which she has mixed, mixed double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, 
and the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen, and I am no widow, and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For be strong is the Lord God who judges her. Now, Babylon is where we would say today, modern day Iraq is the geographical location historically. And many have thought this is going to be rebuilt. We see a transfer of the world's wealth kind of back to that area today with oil and how much money they have over there. Um, It's interesting that the location of this is the same location where the Tower of Babel was built. Uh, In Genesis chapter 11, where mankind came together and built this huge monument, this tower, um, And really, this is the starting point where we get for language, uh, for culture, and people groups. They came from that Tower of Babel. It was a post-flood rebellion. God had told the people that they were to disperse across the land. They were to be fruitful and multiply and disperse. And they rebelled against that. They said, come, let us build ourselves a tower. Let's stay together. Let's thrive and and do these things with contrary to what God has commanded. And so they put down roots in one place and they built this tower they could rally around. And God judged them. He divided their single language into multiple languages. They began confused. And in fact, that's where the word Babylon comes from. Is It sounds like they were babbling. All they heard was babble, babble. And they're thinking, what, what is that person babbling about? And so they begin to find people they could recognize their language and begin to disperse in those people groups and went all over the world today. And so that's why when you look around the world, you see different languages, different people groups, uh, different features in certain groups. Um, that, God, that was God's plan was that we would disperse around the world. Now, when you look at this rebellion that happened at the Tower of Babel, that these nations, these people who once feared God, ignored him and despised his command, not much has changed today. There are still groups today that ignore the word of God and despise his command. And, uh, and God will deal with them as we see here in chapter 18. Now, I do want to make a point here that having money or enjoying things that the government provides, like our local library or roads or police or things like that, uh, it's not bad. Um, you know, money is not good or evil. It's an object. It just magnifies what's already in your heart. If you have a bad heart, money's going to magnify that. <laughs> You're going to be greedy and stingy and, and look out for yourself and use money not for other people but for yourself. If your heart is good and right, then money's going to magnify that. You're going to be a blessing to others. You're going to be a good steward with what you have. Um, and, and God's got to, to, to use that in a way that uh, honors him. And, and we want to be a good steward with it as well. So there's nothing wrong with making money or enjoying things that our government or economy has to offer. There's nothing wrong with having a 401k and riding with the stock market. Nothing wrong with that. But what the Bible is speaking against here, and I think it, we really see this here in verse 7, is that she says in her heart, I sit as queen. And, and I live in luxuriously. Uh, it's really this idea of glorifying yourself. Or in other words, living as king or queen and ignoring the command to help other people. Uh, to have a heart to want to, to share with people. Uh, be a blessing to others. And, and just looking out for yourself. And that's what the, these groups of people were doing here. Uh, they were looking out for themselves. They weren't listening to the Lord. And, um, and so God begins to judge the, the people here. And in this vision, John sees Babylon as a woman who, again, declares herself to be queen. It reminds me today that the promises of the world is that money will make you happy. <laughs> if you just have more of it, it will make you happy. And I remember someone said that it was uh, Rockefeller who had lots of money uh, back in the day. And they asked him, are you happy? And he said, no. And they said, why? He said, I just, I need more money. 
And they asked him, well, how much more do you need? And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Well, how much? Just a little bit more. And, and you're never going to be happy uh, with money. Again, money is just a tool. It's an object. It's a piece of paper. It's a currency. Um, and so if you want to be happy, it's really knowing the Lord, having a relationship with him. And so the Bible offers that, right? The money makes you happy. Riches will make you forget about your sorrows. You can solve problems with if you just had more money. The truth is, you can't solve money problems with more money. It's a lifestyle issue. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta change your behavior. You gotta live within your means. And um, and so here we see that greed and seeking unjust gain are two of Babylon's great sins. And this economic collapse becomes the basis of God's judgment against those people who are cheating, lying, and stealing to get ahead. And they appear to be succeeding, but they're not going to succeed in the end. And we're going to see how they respond to all of this happening next here in verses 9 through about verse 20. So John continues and he says here, verse 9, The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived in luxuriously with her, will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a great distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, Precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, and every kind of citron wood, and every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in Fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For one hour such a great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster who traveled by ship and sailors and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you, holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. We'll pause there. It's interesting that we see the destruction of Babylon here, this, this one world economy, this one world government collapses. And, and the way that people are affected by it. Um, it reminds me the way that John is describing Babylon. Uh, Babylon was the city responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem's first temple. And that happened in 586 B.C. And John uses the symbol to describe the Babylon of his day, which we know as Rome. Rome came in and oppressed the Jewish people. And Rome was in power when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. So history tells us that in 70 AD, the Roman armies marched against Jerusalem. They destroyed the second temple, and then they scattered the Jewish people and dispersed them. And as John's writing the book of Revelation, after the temple has fallen, as Jesus prophesied it would, and now is scattered, it's a reminder to me that history often repeats itself. If we're not careful to learn the Old Testament, learn the history of of what God has given to us, we'll often repeat uh, the past. And so I think we need to learn from the past as we move forward. Solomon wrote about this in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 9. He said, what has been 
will be again. What has been done will be done again. And there is nothing new under the sun. So the devil knows this and he uses it towards his advantage. If something I used in the past with mankind works, great, I'm going to use it again. I'll repackage it a little bit, sell it a little bit different, but I'm sure it's going to work the same. And it does. You think we'd learn? Nope. It happens again and again. And so what we see here is the Antichrist secures the world's allegiance to himself. He rallies the people around this tower of this one world government, this one world currency, this one world economy. And he uses that to get people's allegiance pledged to himself. And he's able then to make the subjects rich as the world begins to sell out principle for profit. And they, they forfeit law for luxury. They become greedy. And it reminds me that people can become infatuated with money. Um, it's interesting that money can do weird things to us. If I gave you $100,000 cash, it would probably be a little weird. In fact, I'll put it this way. If you've ever lent somebody money and you have more to your house for a meal, that meal and the conversation is a little bit different versus if you hadn't loaned that person money to begin with. Uh, there's something there that money, it kind of can distort relationships a little bit, if we're not careful at least. And so the people here, uh, they use this money for their own gain. In fact, some people in our world today use money, in a sense, as a drug to escape from pain because of an empty existence without God. Again, they think more will make them happy. You, you hear about these rich and famous people who get to the top and they've arrived and they've got gold medals and mansions and, and, and servants and butlers and, and maids, you name it. And you ask them, are you happy? And they say, no, I'm empty. I, I, I'm actually thinking about committing a suicide. I, I'm depressed. I'm on all these medications. I'm seeing doctors for help. Um, you know, I just read about Britney Spears again in the hospital. <laughs> After all these years, she still hasn't got it together. Uh, she needs the Lord. And those people who live those lifestyles, they need the Lord. Um, drugs aren't going to solve it. More money's not going to solve it. More people in the crowd worshiping you and adoring you and, and saying, we love you, isn't going to solve it. They need, they need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That will fix the void in their heart and their life. Now, again, as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, are people really interested in a one-world government today? I mean, is there really a desire for that in the world? Well, I found this online poll at debate.org that showed that 62% of the world said they were in favor of a one-world government because it would mean no war, less poverty, less capitalism mindset, and more humanity-centered thinking. So apparently 62% of the world, almost two-thirds, think this idea towards a one-world government is a great idea. It'll stop all the, the war. It'll stop poverty. We'll share kind of this big world socialism thing going on. It's going to be great. We'll all be equal, and it'll be equal playing field. And that's interesting that there's already this mindset. Um, you know, some today see that, uh, that cryptocurrency could play a part in this because there are many who see cryptocurrency as a way to stop um, stealing and illegal activity, uh, stop thieves, um, and others see it as a way to stop the rich from kind of profiting off the economic system that's there. Um, but whatever it is that is developed or created, man-made technology won't last. It'll work for a little bit, but it won't last forever. There's always a loophole in, there's always a way around uh, some software. You hear about banks getting hacked, or there's always someone who could walk in physically with a gun and take money out. I mean, you can't stop theft. And, and, and in fact, that people will think that with the mark of the beast, right? Well, you can take their hand and you can put it on there, on you know their thumbprint and open the door, or, you know those kind of things, and take the mark and you can buy online with your with their hand and order stuff to your house. I mean, there's always going to be a way around. There's always going to be a way that this is not going to work. And so people will weep over the fall of this someday, as we see here in chapter 18. And it reminds me of the way that people feel so connected to the financial world of today. 
and especially the, the institution of credit cards and of debt today. Um, years ago, my wife and I, we um, started looking at how do we handle God's money, God's ways, and uh, we cut up our credit cards, we called and canceled them, and we begin to live off cash and our checkbook and our bank debit card and live within our means and, and start to really budget, be intentional about what we're going to do with our money, put it on, on paper, on a plan, and on purpose. And we begin to hear of others who couldn't cut up their credit cards. They begin weeping at the thought that they would lose this piece of plastic because it meant so much to them. The thought of knowing that I could buy whatever I want and not have to pay for it right now because I don't have the money it made them cry. It was like you're giving, you're taking away something that they can do whatever they want with it. The reality is you're paying a lot more later on, um, and you're really not taking away their freedom. You're taking away bondage. But I see that here, that people are going to cry. They're going to weep over this collapse of the economy. You're taking away our wealth. You're taking away what makes us happy. You're taking away what makes us secure and that now we can't do whatever we want. <laughs> now we can't just spend like Congress and, and spend money we don't have. Um, and, and that's what we see here. That people begin to weep because without money, well, they're not going to be able to get all the things that they want. They're going to actually have to, to, to live a little bit different. And verse 11 tells us here, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over the loss of this one world economy as buying and selling comes to an end. And, and wealth in the end times will mean very little. Right? Jesus said that. You can't take your money with you. It'll perish. He said, if you want riches in heaven, man, you've got to send them up ahead. <laughs> you've got to be doing things that bless and honor him and, and to the least of these. And he'll reward you in heaven. Uh, but if you want to take gold, it's just going to be cement up there. It's pavement. So we want to make sure that our real riches are in Christ Jesus. And, um, you know, it's interesting that, that media today paints a picture of people who have money as the bad guys. You always hear about the 1%, these people, and they're rich and they're stingy. And maybe a couple of them are, but for a lot of them, um, they got there by hard work and by thinking ahead and being diligent. And then you hear about, oh, those who are in debt and the poor man just can't get ahead. And they're the hero of the story, right? And I think this is starting to, to shift in what we're seeing in the world today is that where are you going to start seeing this in this next political run as well, that there are going to be politicians who are going to say, let's erase student loan debt. Let's wipe that out because it's destroying the education of people. In fact, let's give free education to everyone. Man, this, this health care debt, hospital bills, it's, it's destroying people. Let's wipe out health care debt. Let's give free health care to everyone. Uh, you know, transportation is an issue for people, and, and so let's get rid of the auto loan debt. Let's start giving out free cars to people. In fact, let's give free incentives to them to drive these energy-efficient cars. And you're going to start seeing this direction that way, that's going to start heading towards this one-world mindset. And so maybe even free fast food at some point. I don't know. Um, but it's nothing new, right? This is what the devil wants, to, wants people to get focused on. And it really doesn't address the real issue, which is the heart. <laughs> Being content with what you have. Learning to live within your means. Learning to think ahead and, and be responsible and take personal responsibility for your actions. And, and realizing that if you do make a mistake financially, you've got to clean it up. You can't just file bankruptcy and then it goes to the government and now they're further in debt and somebody else has to deal with it. Um, and so our culture often ignores the real problems of today. In fact, I think we see that here too in this list of things they buy and sell in verse 11 through verse 13. It's very fascinating as I was looking at this and all the things that it mentions. And then the last part here of verse 13. And the bodies and souls of men. Or in other words, modern day slavery or what we would call human trafficking. It's not going to go away. It's going to get worse. In fact, this one world system is going to profit off of that. They're going to use it to gain and be rich. And um, I did a little research on this um, because our culture has probably ignored this. And the latest statistic I could find, sadly, was from 2005, which is outdated. 
but it reported that human trafficking was the fastest growing criminal activity in the world. All the nations are facing this issue. It's one of the most lucrative criminal activities at the same time. Over $31 billion in 2005. That was 2005. It's probably well over $31 billion today. Um, and so this problem is clearly growing and it's being mostly ignored by the world today. But it's a lot of women and young girls who are being sold, and, and our culture just kind of ignores it until it finally comes to some criminal activity. Then they put it in the paper, and then they move on to something else. But it's a real issue. Um, in fact, my mom has told me that she hears often of ladies from the Native American reservations uh, that are hitchhiking to get to work, and then you never hear from them again. They're gone. And so, because they have no phone, they have no address, and... And so, you know, there's people that are just, unfortunately, are targeting our world today. And I, I think, sadly, it's because of our culture. Our culture views women as an item or as property, and that's very sad. God tells us that women are created in His image. They have God-given worth and purpose and value, that they should be respected and protected. Um, and, and that's the way, as Christians, we need to respond. Every human life is precious. Every person out there should not be a victim of, of these crimes. And so I, I think as Christians, we have a responsibility to pray for the situation, to speak out against human trafficking, and to try and live in ways that help create and foster change in the lives of those impacted by this tragic crime. Um, there's a film out not too long ago called Priceless, and it covered this subject. And then they did a fabulous job of, of, of kind of bringing it to the forefront of Christians to realize that now is the time for us to step up and do something, to be a part of helping uh, this situation. And so, sadly, we're going to see this takes place in the end times. And the merchants are going to make a lot of money off of this as well. So here, back in our study in verse 15, we see some more insight those who gain wealth from this one world economy, it says they watch from a distance as it falls. Yet it's interesting, they have this fear of the judgment of God. In other words, those who cheat, lie, and steal to succeed will then worry about what's going to happen to them next. They see the fall of this Babylon, this fall of this economy, this one world system, this one world government. They think, okay, if God's judging that, are we next? I think we might be next. And so it's interesting that they begin to weep. They begin to, um, to kind of cry over this. And yet they're still afar from God. And yet God is still giving them opportunity to get right with him. And so we see that Babylon becomes desolate. But it's interesting here in verse 20, we see heaven then begins to rejoice. And there's this contrast that we'll see next in verse 21 through 24 the way that, that earth responds, and then the way that heaven responds to the situation. So let's take a look at that here. Verse 21, it says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down, and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeteers shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of a bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints, and of all who were slain. On the earth. It's interesting in this international community, we see again they respond by mourning the fate of Babylon. That now we can't make the money that we were making before. Now we can't be happy or fulfilled as we thought we were going to be. But we see heaven rejoicing. Again, God told them that He was going to give them double back. <laughs> right? We saw that earlier. Um, that God told them, you know, repay her double according to her works in verse 6. And the cup which she's mixed, mix double for her. Uh, you're doubly reaping what you're sowing. 
And so we see here that Babylon the bartender goes belly up in 60 minutes. Uh, the, and this Babylon the great will bite the dust. And so God mixes her a double shot of righteous wrath at the bar of divine justice. Babylon the great is no longer Babylon the great. It's Babylon the fallen. And we see that all of heaven is rejoicing because this, this one world bank, this united government system that's driven by Satan to get people to worship Satan, to worship the Antichrist, finally comes to an end. There's a collapse of this whole thing. And, and heaven's rejoicing because of this. And I think, let's face it, we can get weary at times if you ever watch the TV news or ever read the paper. Um, if you ever just live life today, um, it can get weary of hearing about the evil and the constant crime and activity going on in the world. I mean, just the other day, another shooting uh, of killing innocent people. It seems like it's almost every other day now in our news. There's another shooting. More people are dead. It's crazy. And we can get almost insensitized to that. Um, and I pray our heart doesn't, that we continue just to weep and pray for those affected by those things. But here we see that, that one day, all that will come to an end. And on this occasion in heaven, we finally see righteous prevails, and it will fill our hearts with gladness. There won't be any more of that going on. Now, it's interesting here, too, that we see that the people, as it says in verse 23 of the earth, were deceived by sorcery. Again, Satan loves to use deceit and sorcery to trap people. You've probably heard the phrase, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And yet people still fall for it all the time. You hear about people, well, if you owe money to the IRS, don't pay them directly. Pay us and we'll help you get rid of your IRS debt. And, and you don't have to pay it in full. You just pay 10% and we'll take care of it for you. People do it. And you think, come on, Really? You're being scammed. And the, and the devil's the chief scammer of all. He loves to scam people, especially out of salvation. No, we don't have to live like a Christian. No, we don't have to love other people. Well, you come this way and you'll be healthy, wealthy, prosperous. Life will be great. Put Jesus in your back pocket. You got your fire insurance. Live how you want to live however you want to be. Just live for yourself and you'll be fine. And, and it's a false gospel. It's a false way to live. And as I was thinking about this chapter, you know, I think most Christians would gasp at the thought of being blatantly dishonest in our dealings, that we wouldn't seek to unjust gain. We wouldn't seek to distort or twist or, or do any sort of uh, evil crime, if you will. But I think if we're honest, there are times when we still traverse this path of dishonesty in subtle ways. I thought, you know, how many people steal from their employer's time by not working or surfing the internet or not showing up on time or leaving early or taking a longer lunch break or how many people steal from their work by using company products for their personal use, taking things or printing on things that shouldn't be done at home or things like that. And that's only a couple of things. I mean, I'm sure there's a whole lot of other things we could look at. But, but there are many subtle ways, if we're not careful, that we can fall in the same trap. Uh, and so we want to be careful. We want to examine our hearts. Um, and the truth is, it's a reminder, we need to ask for the forgiveness of Christ. Uh, we need to realize that our sin costs more than we ever thought. In fact, this is why Christ came, right? Was to pay for our sins. And it was pretty bad. Our sins put Jesus to death. Um, and, and so sin is, sin is pretty bad. And so Jesus paid for our death, though, of sin. That includes every evil thought we ever had, every evil word we said, or every evil action we took. Jesus paid for those. That includes every lie we ever told, every time we ever cheated, every time we had anger towards someone, which Jesus said is murder in the heart, or sometimes we looked at someone with lust. Jesus says that's adultery in the heart. Or even the Tenth Commandment, every time we've ever coveted, we've desired something that God hasn't given us. Saying, God, you're not fair. You haven't provided for me. I want that. And God says, no. <laughs> Jesus died for all of those sins. And, and he, he paid the price for us. And so God has done this through what Jesus has done. 
and it's finished, right? Jesus on the cross yelled out, it is finished. He cried out, paid in full. Your sins have been dealt with. And our sins really killed him. He was buried in that tomb for three days and three nights and then rose from the grave. He defeated it and he's victorious. So we have not only forgiveness of our sins, but everlasting life, a relationship here and now with Jesus Christ and forevermore in heaven. And when we think about that finished work of Christ, that's good news. If we had to pay for our sins, we'd probably be like the people here in, the, in chapter 18, weeping and wailing. Oh no, if this happened to this system, if this happened to Babylon, the, the economy of the world is collapsing, what's going to happen to me? I'm next. But the good news is, Jesus has paid our price. He's, he's taken the wrath that we deserve upon himself. And that's good news, um, that Jesus has done this for us. And we're no longer under a condemnation because we trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And my hope is that every time we have a Bible study and we think about how much God loves us and what he's done for us, that we just leave worshiping him. Sometimes maybe we leave asking, what do you think of the sermon? <laughs> I, I hope afterwards the question is man isn't God great man you think about what we deserve but what Jesus has done for us don't we have a great savior man we should just keep worshiping him and thankful thanking him for all that he's done for us that we don't have to go through this part of revelation we don't have to experience God's wrath and judgment I don't have to pay for my sins they're already paid for thank you Jesus and so that's my hope is that we continue worshiping him and so in closing, um, we'll get to more of this in chapter 19 as well, that we'll see that we'll celebrate because of the power of God has defeated evil. We'll celebrate and rejoice because our Lord reigns. We'll celebrate because the marriage of the Lamb has come. And we'll celebrate because we'll be with our Jesus forever and ever in heaven. And His rule and reign will last forever. Again, we need to know that God has a better plan for the world globalization. Man will try and do it his way, and it'll fail. But when it's under the headship of our King Redeemer, Jesus Christ, his kingdom will endure forever. It'll never end. That'll be the one world government that will, won't collapse. It'll continue forever, for it's under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And his kingdom is ruled by peace and righteousness. And so this will be a splendid time of righteousness and true justice, peace and joyful days, in the kingdom of Christ. And that's another thing that we should be looking forward to, uh, is, is that peace and righteousness with Christ forever. No more bad news on media. No more fake news in the media either. It'll be perfect. It'll be just a happiness with our Lord for eternity. And uh, no, more, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more fear. For all those former things have passed away and will be with our Lord Jesus forever. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, this chapter as we take a look at uh, the second picture of Babylon. Lord, help us not to place our trust in money or in government or leaders of this world, Lord, to solve our problems or to make us happy. Help us, Lord, to look to you to solve our problems, that we would find true happiness and joy in a relationship with you, walking with you, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to keep our eyes on you, that we wouldn't turn a blind eye to sin, but to know, Lord, that you are patient towards us. You have grace towards us, and you give us opportunity to repent so we don't have to face the results and consequences. Help us, Lord, to continue to extend that grace to those around us as well. We know you're not willing any perish, but all come to repentance, that all would come to a saving faith and relationship with you. So God, we ask that if we're guilty in the smallest offense of sinning, Lord, that we would confess it, that we would make restitution, that we'd repent of it. The Lord, we would continue to have a right relationship with you. And we ask, Lord, if there be any here among us this morning, or perhaps listening to this message later online, who need to surrender their life to you, that they need to give their heart and their life over to you, May you convince them to do that. And if you're here this morning, say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to give him my life.
And I'm ready to do that today. If that's you, I just simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and, and truly mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. I believe, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. You shed your life's blood for my debt of sin. That you were in the tomb and rose from the dead. Jesus, I thank you for loving me. And I ask that you would come into my heart and my life today. You'd forgive me of my every sin. That you'd be my Lord and my Master. And that I would follow you from this day forward. Seal me with your Spirit. And fill me with your love. Help me to live my life to please you. I thank you, Lord, for your salvation. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.